All right, so we are on. I am here with Tamika Vasquez. Good, uh, good to have you with us and talking about artificial intelligence. Yeah. All right, so tell me, you have, your bio is fascinating. So you are <laughs> Associate Director of Marketing at, is on Egan Technologies, am I saying that I right? Did. Okay, you are a Professor of Marketing Management at St. John, a guest lecturer at Baruch College? Am I saying yeah, that I one right? That, yeah, do uh, A Strategic <laughs> Advisor to Opus AI and... Bachelor of Arts Corporate Communications, nice. Master of Science Information and Knowledge Strategy. I want to come back to the Knowledge Strategy one. Okay, lots <laughs> of those relate to AI and marketing. Yeah. How did you get interested in artificial intelligence and when did you get interested in artificial intelligence? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting that um, you pointed out the master's degree because that's actually when I got interested in artificial intelligence. Um, okay. My master's thesis was actually working, we kind of had a capstone project, um, working with a company that is in the AI space. So they provide a lot of like cognitive services for companies that have large scale, like customer service operations across the world and things like that. And so they were heavily kind of focused on process automation specific to like large customer service kinds of organizations, but they at the same time just had a really interesting story as far as what they perceived like the future of work to be all about and things like that. Yeah. So working with them on that capstone project actually led to my master's thesis around the impacts and opportunities of cognitive technologies of all kinds on the workforce, but also on the ways that we start to think about public and private partnerships and like, how do you design a future of work? Um, not only through the lens of a corporation, but also through the lens of like the public sector in putting programs in place and all that stuff. So I, I was just like, totally into this topic for <laughs> for almost uh almost a year wrapping up grad school so that's that's how i got into it so not to date ourselves but what year are we talking about when you're working on this thesis uh, it was like 2015 okay because i mean it just well i think like even just in the last so i wrote my second book in 2014 and that uh, was when i started really diving into watson and ai and the application yeah. to marketing and so at the time in marketing and in sales, like it wasn't really being taught. We were still stuck on traditional marketing automation. So 2015 was in our industry still pretty early to actually be starting to think about these bigger picture things. Yeah, it's crazy because like I, I see so many of the themes now that I'm like, oh, wait, we were talking about this almost at an introductory level with companies, you know, in management consultancies like McKinsey and Gartner and yeah. all those folks that were just kind of now entering that space of figuring out how do they want to advise companies. So it was crazy because like it's only four or five years ago, but to your point, it, it could have easily been like, you know, much longer ago when you look at the the knowledge gaps that exist in that space. So yeah, it's never a dull moment. <laughs> so what is, what is, inf I'm actually like going to my last questions first because <laughs> now I'm intrigued. So the information and knowledge strategy what is the premise behind that degree so master of science information and knowledge strategy like what are, when you're doing that what are you thinking of coming out with before you found your thesis and everything yeah um yeah certainly well before i even thought about the the thesis topic um so the way i, I think about that program is knowledge management is a very big space that a lot of people don't quite understand because they don't understand the differences between when you say something like knowledge versus something like data or information or things like that so the program is really interesting in that it allows you to dig into a subject matter that mixes library science you know which is like tried and true kind of where do you find information and how do you sort of catalog information and organize information and sort of understanding that very closely, but then understanding the systems that support that in a modern business context, and then understanding all of the people that kind of play within that space, you know, who need to either share information or uh, kind of build um, knowledge based on information that might have existed in a certain sector that you now have to translate over into yours and kind of figuring out the people, the process, the technologies, all of that stuff, how it comes together in this world of information. And then how, the, how does that eventually become knowledge? So the entire premise of the program is really to kind of get you up to speed with all of those things. But at the same time, it doesn't matter what industry or sector you're in. So at the time I was working uh, for a company that was serving the financial industry. Um, I was in a marketing role I was kind of looking after all of the things that sound like marketing, but a lot of what I had to do and a lot of the initiatives that I was driving um, required people, process, technology, and really being able to translate knowledge from one side of the business to the other or from within the business to outside the business. So it was just really helpful to have that kind of understanding of 
information, have that understanding of strategy, and be able to bring all of that within the context of my role um, and understand how I am a knowledge worker, you're a knowledge worker, like, you know, how does that all play up into this whole world of, of business, of society, of cultures, of the ways that we interact and all of that stuff. So it was really fascinating just as a study, but I think I'm a really good uh, sort of case study in terms of what sounds like an IT degree um, being translated into somebody that is in a you know more traditional business function. Interesting. Yeah, because when I first saw it, I immediately thought of knowledge graphs. So that's like a yeah. in relation to AI. Um, Yext is a company that I'm familiar with that yeah. they're basically trying to power that. They're building a knowledge graph of data around businesses that enables when I then conduct a voice search, that the way Alexa or Siri may gather that information is through extracting from a knowledge graph and being able to then produce responses. So there's five layers of AI mixed in there, but knowledge graph is the core of what enables it. Exactly. Find the information. Exactly. Right. So your topic at the Marketing AI Conference is don't let them scare you. The future is marketer and machine. Now, I remember when I saw this submission, I was like, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> now, I, then I like jumped right to the description. I was like, do, do I agree with her? I'm really <laughs> fascinated to see her approach. So give me just kind of the high level when you were sending us the idea for this talk. What, what is your basic premise behind the future is market machine, don't let them scare you? Yeah, it's, I tend to come up with really quirky things like that. So um, my thought process at the time, I think, was sort of, I'm in a weird spot because I'm a marketer, but I'm in the AI industry. What we're seeing now and why I'm super excited for this conference is we're seeing now marketers kind of looking at the opportunities to leverage AI. So it's a bit of a, a you know, sitting on a different side of the same sort of um, space. Yeah. Um, and so I think I was sort of in that space of thinking about AI almost exclusively without really putting on the marketing hat. Once I applied the marketing hat, I realized, yeah, everybody's talking about the hysteria around, you know, machines taking your jobs and um, things that a machine can do that a human can't and all of these other sort of um, conversations that were happening in the space of AI. But then when you put on your marketing hat, you're like, wait a second, no, we need all of that stuff to happen so that we can do what we do much better. Um, right. And I think, you know, for me, it's just kind of like thinking of this whole marketer and machine future, I, I, find, I find very fascinating. Um, so kind of thinking about traditional marketing is like, I need to deliver the right message to the right customer at the right time. And then you overlay that with like the power of AI to allow you to do things that we like to talk about, like segmentation, like prediction, like, <laughs> you know, all these super cool things. personalization, yeah. like all these super cool things that we talk about. And we don't realize like, no, the future is us learning how to work with these systems to deliver what it is that we claim we want to achieve. So yeah, yeah. I, I love it. every time I do a talk. So I always my general talks I give at big conferences is always more the macro level introduction because most yeah. marketers still have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. so it's like, here's what it is. Here's a bunch of examples in your life where you use it every day. Here's a bunch of use cases in marketing. And then you have you inevitably someone in the audience starts asking about the dystopian outcome of this like yeah. well but what happens when and so i did one recently and it was a bunch of really smart people and they started asking all these questions about impact on politics and society right. and workforce and so somebody asked me at the end like i think it was one related to writing and mm -hmm. the lady started her question with can you can you just tell us it's gonna be okay like, and she started like, basically for 45 minutes, she'd sat there worrying that, that she was done as a professional. And I try really hard not to give that impression. I am all the mar all about marketing machines, one of the core points I make. But some people just sit back and start thinking about the weight of yeah. having to learn all this and understand it. But when you know, someone like you, where you're sitting on both sides and you're seeing, no, this is, this can be good. Like it doesn't <laughs> have to be scary. But a lot of people just go right to this is scary because I don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, another another thing I like to talk about is like, how do we rewrite the narratives of the future? Yeah. Um, you know, and it's it's like it applies to everything because from a marketing perspective, it's like we want to tell better stories and we want to kind of, you know, get people excited about the future of something, whether it's a, a technology or, a you know, some an item or just a way of thinking. We always want to get people excited about something in the future. But then when you actually like, see the reality of how people are interacting with these technologies of the future, you realize there's such a huge disconnect. So to some extent, I even think marketing, you know, in this context of AI is, is actually probably our best bet in terms of getting the right narrative out there about the power of these technologies, but also like 
showing that it's already embedded into your daily life. It's yep. just the way you see it, you know? I, I literally show my iPhone screen as a slide and it's like every <laughs> app on here is using AI. Like you, exactly. you use it a hundred times today and you even think about it. Exactly. exactly. So what do you, so when you think about, you know, I always look at three to five years. I never try and get beyond five years because none of us can even guess yeah. at that. <laughs> but in the next say three years, what do you think are the uniquely hum, human skills and traits that you know, machines may augment or assist it, but generally speaking, the things that are going to remain uniquely human for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm going to sound a bit like a hippie, but I think <laughs> the you, you really uniquely human things are the things that we don't quite know what to call yet. <laughs> so things that allow you to understand the world in a very nuanced way, things that allow you to bring complex sort of topics and themes and ideas together, the things that allow you to build or rebuild in our case, kind of, you know, systemic ways of doing things. Um, I think that's what's uniquely human. And I think it's the thing that people take for granted because we don't understand the ways that our brain works. Like we don't understand the ways that I can hear an idea and it can inspire so many different touch points, right? Mm -hmm. I can look at the world and I can navigate it in such a, a unique fashion. I can look at things that are complex and break them down into smaller pieces. Like those things that are just part of how we navigate the world and how we navigate society and life is so uniquely human. It's it's like not even funny, right? Like yeah. it's it's something that's so unique to us. So I think just having kind of this like keen consciousness of what's the global environment? You know, what is the awareness that we need to drive around the ways that we're living and working and thriving and all that stuff? What are the moving parts and the dimensions that interplay in all of that? That's uniquely human. Every job to some extent should have some mandate for you to apply that type of complex, you know, sort of skill set. So whether that's in through the realm of communications, through the realm of leadership, um, through the realm of being able to negotiate you know, being able to create something new, um, being able to just kind of be inspiring or, you know, be inspired, like all of those things should be embedded into any job that is meant to stand the test of time. If you're talking three to five years. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I think it, you, the first thing you're describing to me is like the intuition, yeah, empathy, not like yeah. There's, you can use natural language processing to, in, to assign emotion to things or to trigger emotion, but understanding emotion and the impact of what you do and the emo like that, that's just not stuff that you can teach the machines. Like we're yeah. not there yet technologically and I don't know that we will get there. So yeah, that's cool. It's a, it's and it's a cool stuff we take for granted. You know, I think, um, I think the, the one benefit of being an educator is you can kind of see what the future of thinking is going to be. And a lot of my students, you know, really are thinking about like, wait, that's a job, you know, like, am I really going to be doing that for 20 years? And I think the reason they feel kind of stifled by it before even entering the workforce oftentimes is because the way we've defined jobs has been purely through like, how effective can you be at something or how efficient can you be at something? And it's like, well, technically that's stuff that more and more you see machines able to sort of do. But if you ask people like, how creative can you be at something? Or how can you build a certain expertise around something? Like that would make somebody who's in college more excited to get out into the workforce because that'll show them that I can't necessarily be replaced due to not being fast enough or not being efficient enough, but I can somehow be valued for my ability to create something new, my ability to think creatively, my ability to look at, you know, the world and, and systems and, and sort of complexities in my own unique lens and be paid for that. Awesome. Like yeah. it changes the entire narrative. So, yeah. That's awesome. All right. So, I want to do one more because you already very dove into the information and knowledge. So <laughs> your strategic advisor for Opus AI, which based on the website is focused on using AI to ensure fairness and increase diversity at large organizations. Mm -hmm. Why is that important and how are they in the industry tackling that challenge? Yeah. So what Opus AI is doing is kind of taking a proven method where you don't have to see a person's name, know their gender, know what city they live in and things like that as part of your evaluation process of whether or not they qualify for a job. Those are not factors that matter, right? So what they're doing is taking the proven method of blind candidate screening where you don't see those things up front and you just purely get 
a resume that tells you what skills does this person have, you know, sort of things that are actually going to matter for the role itself. Um, and being able to produce candidate profiles that are kind of taking out anything that could in some knee jerk reaction way create bias, right? So if mm -hmm. you see a name, and you can't pronounce it, that might cause you to react a certain way. Or if you see a city and it's a city that isn't known for anything particularly positive, you know, or if it's a school and it's like, well, my daughter went there. It's like all of those things that could create some sort of reaction of bias, whether positive or negative, they're taking that out of the candidate profile and just providing you with the stuff that matters. That's essentially what they're doing. But the process is, you know, before you would print out a resume and like literally put a Sharpie over somebody's name and city and things like that. So what they're doing is um, kind of using machine learning to automate that process. So once you get them through an applicant tracking system, what you get on the other end is just the profile that's just going to tell you what matters in terms of their skill sets, in terms of their experience, you know, all of those things that you can sort of check some boxes, but not have it be disrupted by anything that could create bias, like somebody's name or gender and things like that. Yeah, that's huge. And I mean, you probably saw recently where Amazon was actually using machine learning where bias, they had to shut it down because bias was actually and it, forcing them to hire more white males, basically. Yeah. So they realized that they trained it on workers and they realized there was human bias in their hiring practices for the last two decades. Uh -huh. And that was what then trained the machine learning algorithm. And so they had to stop it because they, it was bias. Mm -hmm. And so it's like sometimes the AI can be used for bad. And that's, I, I, so I love that example because that's what marketers aren't thinking about. Like they're yet to even figure out how to use machine learning, not realizing that once they start any human bias that has gone in to how they've previously looked at data or made decisions is going to be trained into the systems. Exactly. And if we don't think about the ethical and moral application of machine learning, we're going to, as an industry, just start using machine learning for all these things and not realize we're just reinforcing bias that has been there for decades. And that that's the key from the marketing perspective, you know, so going back to what I said earlier about like rewriting the narrative, it, it, part of rewriting the narrative requires that you assume that whatever I see is limited. Whatever I see might have might have been hard coded with some sort of bias, like and I need to be able to challenge that and I need to be able to take the measures that would improve that and prevent that moving forward. And part of that is creating a diverse workforce. So it's something that, you know, particularly at Opus AI, we, we strongly believe in, obviously, you know, and just having a more diverse workforce that um, can sort of spot these things a lot faster. Um, and then from the marketing side where you see these things that just happen, you know, these blunders that happen all the time with brands that release something that's super insensitive in their advertising or, you know, are targeting people in a way that's that's based on assumptions and not really based on any sort of facts. Um, we're seeing a lot of those things happen. And I think, again, being on both sides, being in the AI industry, but also understanding how to leverage AI, um, I'm, I'm constantly seeing like, we really need to take uh, more proactive measures to ensure that not only the way we market is different, but who we're marketing to feels included and represented in all of that stuff too. All right. Well, I want to come to your session. <laughs> I, I I hope hope you I, yeah, I hope I can find time to slip away. So Obviously. again, I just want to thank you for one, being a part of the conference two, taking the time to you know, talk a little bit about your thoughts and where you see this all going. Um, definitely look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, come July. Definitely. So again, Tamika Vasquez, don't let them scare you. The future is market or machine. That one's going to be on July 17th. So it'll be kind of day one of the conference. Yep. Um, so definitely, if you're going to be at the conference, I would recommend checking it out. So thank you again for being thank with you. us. I really look forward to talking with you again. Yeah, same. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Take care.